I'm Dana Burtness. We're here at Nettle Valley Farm, which is our roughly 80 acre homestead farmstead here in the beautiful Driftless area of southeastern Minnesota. I run our farm with uh, my husband Nick Wynn, and our main enterprise here is pastured pigs. We also run an incubator farm program, so right now we're hosting two young beginning farmers who also have livestock. We share equipment, we share land, and help them sort of get started with the hopes that they will buy their own farms in the near future and stay in the area. Here on Nettle Valley Farm, we raise all of our pigs in a wagon wheel formation. So in the center, we have, you can see that behind us, we have their shade, their feed, and their water. And then we run them on pastures surrounding the wagon wheel hub. And in those various pastures, we grow small grains, various kinds of clovers, annual and perennial grasses, sometimes food crops that we, we could harvest and use for human consumption or just feed to the pigs. In previous years, we've run the pigs through our pine and walnut plantation. We also have about 50 acres of elm and oak uh, woods that we, in the past we have run the pigs through. This spring they got a forestry mowing and so they were, they were, t were taking a year off of uh, pasturing the pigs in the woods, so for more of a silvopasture idea. I think you could sum up the philosophy of our farm, of Nettle Valley Farm, as we want, I mean, it sounds so cliche at this point because uh, so many other regenerative farmers are using it, but just trying to model our farm after natural principles and working with nature instead of against nature. Considering at their core, what do pigs need? A pig is really a woodland creature. I think Darby Simpson put it best when he said, if you put a pig down in the middle of a field, it's not gonna stay in that field. It's gonna run and find shade and be in the woods. And so just thinking about how can we design our pastured pig systems to best suit pigs while also meeting our goals. In, in this situation, in this context, with the land that we have available, that means working on thinning out the woods so in the future they're gonna be available for silvopasture. Um, and then in the meantime, planting really yummy, diverse pastures for the pigs to forage through. And then also providing them with ample shade, as much food as, as they wanna eat. We use a certified organic pea and barley feed. Um, and then as much fresh water as they want to drink. Pig happiness is our number one goal. I mean, we kind of think of ourselves as not pig farmers, but pig happiness managers. And when you've got a happy pig that is eating what they want to eat, frolicking when they want to frolic, um, having a wide variety of food, lots of exercise, they love to run around, all of that ends up translating into super, super flavorful, nutrient-dense food for ourselves and for our community and for the people who support our farm. We think at the end of the day, it does mean a safer pork supply because, I mean, there's some really interesting research coming out about where these superbugs come from. And there are some really concerning links between factory farms and superbugs that affect not only livestock, but then are mutating into potential pandemics that can affect us. When you raise pigs in these environments, you're not creating those cramped, unsanitary conditions where illnesses like that can thrive and take over. I mean, not to say that we never have sick pigs, we certainly do, um, and we treat them individually with, with the help of holistic animal um, consultants and then our local vet, um, but you don't have thousands of pigs dying from the same virus that somehow bred in a, in a manure pit that's like just feet underneath them. So yeah, I, I do think that pastured animals and incorporating them into regenerative farms is a safer way to raise meat. I know that in the past our pigs have had a roundworm parasite that can live in the soil. The eggs of the parasite can live in the soil. And I also know for a fact that humans can get that parasite. So I have some real questions about how long parasite eggs actually persist in the soil and what are some practices that you could do to say, I don't know if it's cultivate the soil to bring those worm eggs up and get them exposed to UV light. I have a lot of questions about that and I don't want to get give anyone an internal parasite so I'd, I'd like a lot more information about that. So I see the parasite and the, the pig poop issue translating pretty clearly into a tree crop situation. Because if I'm walking through my silvopastured rows and I step in some pig poop and then I climb up a ladder and, and pick something and I get that on my hand, or if there's something that 
falls to the ground and then gets harvested for human consumption, not for pigs, I could see that being an issue. You just make sure that you're, you know where, <laughs> where the poop is and making sure that you're avoiding it and that, that contact between the two. Really thinking through what your boots are doing, how they're interacting with your equipment. Um, maybe you need to have several sets of boots around the farm on a diverse farm. Um, so you've got your pig poop boots, you've got your chicken poop boots, um, and then maybe you've got your uh, tree crop boots or something like that. Um, I think sanitizing, sanitizing your hands obviously in between working with your pigs or your other kinds of livestock and then working with your, your tree crops or um, veggie crops. That's, that, that would be super important, especially making sure you get underneath your nails. But other than that, I imagine it's gonna be a lot of asking folks who have the longest amount or have the most years of experience with incorporating livestock into human consumption crop fields. Like what are their practices and how are you safe? And is there any sort of testing that you could do, spot testing on your crop to make sure that you're not getting contaminants? I think a change in the narrative, the general narrative about food safety would be helpful. Because right now, it seems very fear-based and very, the, the conversation seems very oriented to um, benefiting farms that already are very segregated and controlled and um, those farms, those farming practices aren't necessarily gonna get us the soil regeneration and uh, biodiversity regeneration that we wanna see on the landscape. So I think moving away from this idea that any little tiny thing, a bird flying over, over your field um, is gonna contaminate a crop. I mean, I think we do need to take a deep breath, step back, realize that people have been farming in concert with livestock and animals for however long. And we're still here. <laughs> yeah, hold on. Hold on.